Hey, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I try to go for the longest title award, I think, this year. Uh, how, how CNET and Friends use CNCF landscape to run high traffic, dynamic, uh, scalable, cost-effective websites. Um, also, just went for all those great buzzwords, right? My name's Corey McGalliard. I'm an engineering manager for a company called Red Ventures, probably the largest media company you've never heard of. Uh, we own CNET, but also quite a few other large websites. You can go check out the website later uh, to learn about us. But, um, but I've, I've been with CNET specifically for about three, three and a half years now. Um, and CNET's been around for a while. It started in 1994. It was originally a TV network. Not a lot of people actually realize that we started with the focus on TV and then shifted to web presence afterwards. Uh, we see about 45 billion requests monthly at edge, and uh, 10 billion requests at origin per second, which is probably a metric we're more comfortable with. That's 20,000 requests a second in five to 10, depending on the metric you look at, down to the actual containers at, at origin, right? Um, CNET has a rather long history of acquisition. So starting in 94, they started gobbling up brands and then was purchased by CBS Interactive in 2008. And then when I joined CBS Interactive in 2009, they were being acquired, or, uh, sorry, in 2019, they were being acquired by Viacom. And then we were sold to Red Ventures a year after that. Um, we also have quite a bit of technology leadership. Um, over the years, CNET, because we've been around, right, and have developed stuff, we actually developed Solar, um, the search index, and that was donated to Apache. Uh, we also were active with MooTools, and then we adopted Docker and Docker Swarm actually really, really early. I've seen references back to 2015, 2016 era uh, when, when that started to kind of uh, take, take shape. And then also, uh, we have a, the links are here for most of these are either talks or, or documents about the history. But we've been pretty open about our uh, Google Cloud migration over the last three years. Um, so why Kubernetes, right? So this is uh, a talk to really kind of talk about why we made the decision as an organization to, to move from Docker Swarm to Kubernetes. Um, we uh, started about two and a half, three years ago, really initiating the, 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 the process of doing this. Um, and the first few things, I think everybody will like n agree with these things, they're really comfortable with. We see it is a super flexible platform, has all, this, all these tools available to it, and there's really high industry adoption. For us, we were really comfortable with containers. We've been using them for years, so the step into Kubernetes world was actually really, really smart and easy for us to do, right? Um, but then, uh, what really kind of sold it for us is managed Kubernetes. We're in Google, so we get what I consider the cream of the crop of the managed Kubernetes world. Um, gives us visibility and control. I kind of I'll share I share with you in a bit the difference between what it was like to live in a Docker Swarm world and a managed Kubernetes world today. Um, additionally, um, I'm going to get some groans probably from you guys today. We like uh, the managed Kubernetes for click ops ability, and I'll kind of share why in a bit. Um, and then we were, in, when we first moved, started moving into GKE, uh, the GKE team released a version of Kubernetes called GKE Autopilot. The day it released or that it was announced, I spun a cluster up and started throwing some workloads on it, in it to see if it would support our workloads. And it was something that we were really, really interested in. Primarily because we can look at the Kubernetes API as kind of a service, right? And we can just throw a container at it and we don't have to worry about the nodes or managing the control plane or anything like that. It really just gives me the API capabilities that I like, but um, it doesn't add complexity to our general workloads and we can also uh, interact with the CNCF ecosystem, which is probably why we're all here, right? Um, and additionally, um, why Kubernetes developer and customer experience. Um, our engineers um, aren't infrastructure engineers. They, why, they, they just want to write node code, right? And be able to submit containers to an API and give them a really consistent response. But you also see how flexible we've set it up to be over the last couple of years. So this is what Docker Swarm looks like, if anybody's never used it um, from a node perspective. The barrier of entry to interact with Swarm meant that an engineer would have to SSH onto, an, onto a, a manager node and run commands against it, right? So we could get really good information. We could get the containers that were running. We could get the, uh, the um, images they were running, how many, um, how many containers 
we're running and stuff like that. It was visible, but for our general day-to-day -day engineers, they're not going to want to go do this. Moving to Google, we were able to give them a really nice dashboard, free out of the box, right? So we can see the containers. This is actually the front end of CNET, by the way. Um, we could see the, um, the containers that are running the front end. You can see the resource utilization requests. We're over-provisioned pretty heavily in Pride because we want to make sure that you all get really good experiences as you hit our site. Um, and then you can also uh, really easily get to logs. Uh, I can't see my pointer, but up there. And then inside the containers themselves, you can see not only the entire deployments logs, but the container logs with just a click of a button. Um, but additionally, you have the ability to modify your deployment really easily. We don't have permissions to production by default. We have to request that, right? So even, even me as a platform engineer, I have to request those permissions. But what this has allowed us to do is to give us a really easy way for our engineers to, to make the same request and then adjust scaling on scaling events. Like if we hit a Black Friday, Cyber Monday, we can prepare for that. Or if all of a sudden an iPhone gets announced and we're getting more traffic than we anticipated, we can very easily make it a change and give that um, control to our engineers. Um, this is um, the next step really kind of, that's like the way that the, the point behind uh, why, why we chose to go towards GKE specifically. But this is our uh, CNCF tool chain and a couple other open source and internal tools that I'd like to talk about today, and we'll get into those details in a minute. So let's kind of put that together, right? So what happens is, is like you'll start with a Slack message to say, hey, can you, um, can you take a look at this ticket? And then uh, we go to the ticket, and it might not, necessar not necessarily be the ticket we want, but it's the one we deserve. We validate that it's not an April Fool's joke, because it's Comic Sans, right? And then we, uh, we make a commit. We push that up to Git. And we're a Jenkins shop. That's probably my second, like, awe moment for, for, for now. And we, based on the, um, the branch and the sandbox name, we can request a ephemeral environment or a sandbox and build it out. It gives our engineers the capability to very quickly compare the front door of CNET to their change. It takes all of five minutes. What's nice about this, this isn't running locally. This is running in a Kubernetes inside of Google Cloud, and then I can give that link to a product manager. And the product manager can then can validate what they requested us to do and say whether or not it's what they wanted. So what makes all this possible? The first thing are the Kubernetes objects. We should all be pretty familiar with those. I'm going to walk through them kind of quickly uh, just to kind of share how we kind of structure things. So we'll have a deployment uh, that obviously spins up pods. In this situation, I'm just wanting one Node.js pod next to an Nginx pod. That's pretty common practice, right? And then the next thing we're going to have in between those pods are services. The oddly named node service is a, uh, an artifact of us using Docker Swarm and Docker Compose and how you would name services in Docker. And there's configuration typically, or so sorry, so that, that's why that's named that way. And then the ingress that allows traffic to come inside the cluster uh, and flow through the services to the pod. So kind of a drawing wise, this is kind of how it works. So right, the request comes into the ingress object and then is passed through the service um, on that ingress object. And then Nginx is configured to look at node and pass this, the request down. And then Nginx and node can scale up and down as we need. Um, this is our typical um, kind of simplified ingress um, definition. I'm going to walk through all those annotations, which that's really the power behind the CNCF world, in my opinion, is how we can quickly pull in different tools and augment the native um, Kubernetes APIs. Uh, and then also there's config maps and secrets. This is showing a secret for a TLS certificate. You can see where the certain key typically would be. I shortened them so that they would fit on the screen. But also uh, a secret typically uh, sit encoded on disk and not necessarily um, uh, in, clean, in plain text, right? Um, or all inside of the yeah, CD. So that's how Kubernetes does, it th does its things. And these are our internal um, open source and CNCF tools that we're going to kind of walk through. The first one's Helm. Helm for us um, really uh, is obviously a package manager, right? So anything that, can, um, that we run inside of our clusters kind of gets bundled in, in a chart and helps us kind of move those uh, deployments into the cluster. 
Um, we like it because of the deployment history. Um, we have jobs that allow us to look at the deployment history and roll back. What, what I appreciate a lot about Helm, it doesn't just capture the container image change, but it captures any image, anything that changes in the, um, the manifest itself. So if I make an ingress change and I work it, right, and, and I have to come back, it's really easy to, to pull back that config change. Um, and then also gives us some uh, f flexibility in the manifest themselves. How many people are, are setting out image tags today, right? So like that's been a, pa a pattern in the past to where you would set up a deployment and you would change the image tag based on um, uh, using a sed command. Um, Helm has gave, given us the ability to really easily uh, pass values down into our, uh, our manifest um, and make them really, really flexible. And it gives us the ability to have the multiple environments based off of one chart. Um, it also gives us logic, gates, and loops. So in some situations, we want our sites to be external, public to the internet, right? In some situations, we don't. And that, having a true false statement is really easy to do to, to um, get that set up. And then looping, if you want multiple host names, we have multiple host names all over the place because um, of different paths we like to take. Um, the, and I don't have any other really easy way of uh, demonstrating Helm, but traffic ingress controller uh, is something that we've used since we've been in the Docker Swarm. Um, it, it was really, really flexible and easy for us to use there, but we brought it over into Kubernetes because it was familiar and it was um, one less step we had to take into the Kubernetes world, right? Um, it's super, we use it similar to the way in, Nginx is used to where it's host and path-based routed. So once a request gets to the traffic ingress load balancer based on the host that's passed, we're able to pass it down to the service that's, um, that is specified. And it also supports certificate or cert manager and external DNS and GCP load balancing. Um, we can kind of see how that works here. This is the same ingress I showed you guys a minute ago with our friendly red boxes, right? And so um, we have the ingress class of, of traffic that identifies, hey, uh, this ingress is, is associated to traffic. And so traffic starts listening and paying attention to this ingress. And based on the host name that is set, um, traffic will um, traffic the ingress controller or route traffic to the correct service that is listed on the ingress. Uh, traffic um, has always been hard to talk about when you're just differentiating the name of the service and <laughs> actual internet traffic, which has been fun. Uh, anyway, uh, you can also augment traffic with the with, uh, help of annotations. Um, and I'll also call out that traffic has its own CRD to do some similar things. We chose to use ingress so that we have some flexibility going, uh, the ingress objects, so we have flexibility if we ever need to change our ingress controller. Um, yeah, and I also call it the TLS section. That's going to be important when we talk about Cert Manager. So traffic is aware of how uh, of the, the TLS information I'm setting there and the secret name I'm setting. When it when there's a valid Cert uh, attached, traffic will um, actually be the per the the part that that um, terminates the TLS certificate. So now we we have the application running. We've got our cluster and our, and our uh, load balancer listening for the host name, right? So we technically could, with a host, hit the load balancer and get there. The problem is we don't have DNS. In the past, there'd be a support ticket. Uh, external DNS allows us to set up a, uh, a tool that will automate DNS creation for us, right? Um, this is actually a configuration on the external DNS service. I tell it my cloud provider, and I tell it the, the GCP project I'm in. And then this is... Um, kind of what kind of allows the uh, external DNS pod to make some DNS changes. So external DNS comes up in the cluster. It doesn't have permissions against Google. So we have to authorize that somehow, right? So GKE has a, has a feature called workload identity. Uh, AWS has a very similar tool as well. But workload identity allows us to bind a Kubernetes service account with a Google service account, right? So that my external DNS pod can inject routes or inject DNS records as needed because it's authorized to do that in, inside of um, Google Cloud. Based on the same ingress object I created earlier, you can, you can use external DNS, external DNS a couple ways. We're using it to target a host name that's pointed at a load balancer. So what's gonna happen is the host spec on the, uh, on the ingress will get, have a C name created pointed at my target that's listed in the annotation. 
And so that takes approximately a minute and a half uh, at most for that to propagate, right? Um, it's five minutes is the default to say, but it, uh, paying attention to it is really, really fast. Um, and so now we can get traffic to, to my containers, to my workload. We can see our beautiful Comic Sans, uh, and that's allowing us just to get there. But the problem, the next problem we have to deal with is certificate management, right? So in the past, that was always a support ticket, uh, going out to uh, some provider, filling out a massive form, uh, getting an email, stuffing that into, a, into a, a random secret somewhere, putting that in swarm days, we would have to manually put that into a secret and then update our workload in order to like pull that into the actual application. Certificate man Manager automates all that. I went to the booth earlier this week and, and thanked those guys so much because I saved about a month and a half dev time annually just by automating cert rotation. I love Kubernetes. Cert Manager may be my favorite tool in, in, in the tool chain. No joke. OK, so Cert Manager, very similar. Um, you have some containers running in your, in your cluster, right? And then you have to create a certificate issuer. Basically, it's an issuer that points at an SA. This one's looking at Let's Encrypt. And it's doing DNS um, challenge authorization, right? Um, why that's important for us, so you can do HTTP validation where, where your container comes up and it comes out from the inside and it validates, hey, yeah, you own that domain. But we do a lot of internal work, right? Because we don't want to surface the front end, uh, a dev version of the front end of CNET and Google scrape it, scrape it and it kill our SEO scores. So uh, we do a lot of internal work, right? So we need to be able to validate these certs internally so that um, we get, um, top to bottom consistency with our uh, development and production environments. Um, so we set up the cert issuer, and then we have to do the same thing with cert manager to tie the service account for cert manager to, to external DNS, or I mean, sorry, to, to uh, Google uh, service account. So basically allowing cert manager to do the same kind of um, DNS writing as uh, external DNS does. And what's gonna happen I think I've got this. Okay, yeah, sure. So the we specify the issue we want to use, and we set, and we also specify the TLS information under the host of the TLS information. That's the SAN that that the uh, cert is provisioned for, and then the secret name is the name of the the Kubernetes secret that the certificate is stuffed into, right? And so. Um, uh, yeah, let me walk through that whole, whole process. So what's going to happen is. Um, a request is going to be created for a certificate. Um, then it's going to be sent to Let's Encrypt through Cert Manager. Cert Manager is going to create a DNS record, an Acme DNS record with a text record from the response from, from, uh, from Let's Encrypt. And then Let's Encrypt is going to say, hey, yeah, you own that. Here's the certificate. And it's going to stuff it in that secret, right? Uh, and then there's a CRD available with Cert Manager. And you can watch it happen in real time and see the status of the certs. Um, and then once that all happens, the cert is actually inside the secret. So what's, what's really beautiful about this, for those of us who care about MTLS or, or certificate um, validation at all, is not only can my ingress use this or any other object inside of Kubernetes, but also uh, my pods can mount them as um, actual files. So if I need to give Nginx um, a valid certificate, I can create one and hand it to it, or if I need to give Envoy proxy. So in this situation, we give it both to Nginx and to traffic. So all of that lets us put Comic Sans on a temporary environment, right? So that's great. That's a lot of work to get Comic Sans out there. Um, the next thing that's going to happen is the engineer is going to go to the product manager and be like, hey, look, I did my job. I'm going to merge this pull request in, right, once they get the approval. And then we're going to forget about this environment, right, because we're terrible at cleaning up after ourselves. Everybody agree? So we wrote a tool internally called Deckhand based on this, our CSCD process. And this is a process we want to clean up and, and automate a little bit better. But um, today, um, based on our CSCD process, we get to say how long those containers run. And we set a day. And what we do is we create a config map that has a spe special label on it that spe specifically says that you can delete this thing with the date and time. I'm OK with you deleting it. And then we have a cron job that runs hourly. Maybe. There it goes. Um, a cron job that runs hourly, hourly to validate 
um, where, uh, when and where that, that namespace can be, be deleted. Uh, once you hit that purge date, the uh, namespace, will, namespace will, be, will be cleaned up and we've cleaned up that for ourselves. Um, so that's really how our ephemeral environments work. I'll talk about the, the move to, to, to prod in a second. Um, in all of our environments, we have very similar observability stacks. We have Prometheus, which is a time series um, database that allows us to scrape um, all the containers in, in our cluster as well as uh, resources outside of our cluster. Um, we use it actually to monitor uptime of uh, um, GCE ingresses um, as well, not just stuff inside of our cluster. Uh, and that, all of that data can be um, visualized with a tool called Grafana. Um, this is one of my favorite dashboards. It shows us latency, throughput, uh, that's all using the traffic ingress controller metrics, uh, the error rates as well. And then I can, in the same workload, this is just one workload, uh, I can see how, how saturated the CPU and memory is. So this is, if you're familiar with the uh, SRE principles of the golden signals, these are the five, or sorry, four. The bottom two are really the same. It's just memory and, and uh, CPU. All of that information then can be serviced to a tool called Alert Manager, which allows us to pay attention to how well our, how well our services are, are running, right? So we can, we can write alerts that say, hey, if we have a delta change on, um, on error rate, so we all of a sudden have a 50% error rate increase or a 10% error rate increase, increase, page the person who owns this service or memory or whatever thing you care about. Uh, and, and additionally, um, we are investigating on all of, all of this together, looking at our cloud provider, Google, with their, uh, with their um, observability tooling as well. This is the same dashboard reimagined with Google's um, uh, dashboarding as well. So, it, so the, the cool thing about Kubernetes and, and using your cloud provider's native tooling is that we have like crazy visibility into our workloads today, right? And we can see when things are going well and when things aren't, and we can be alerted on them as necessary. Okay. So I've talked about a sandbox environment, and that's probably not what you want to hear. Right? You want to hear what we do for production. We do the exact same thing. All the way top to bottom, development, sandboxing, production. The only things that change are these things, right? Um, how we handle internal versus external traffic routing, whether it's coming through an internal load balancer or external load balancer. Um, and that's usually handled with annotations on ingress and logic gates in Helm. Uh, how we handle replica accounts. We don't run one pod in prod, right? We're gonna run close to a couple hundred. Um, we also open up resource requests and limits in production. Uh, we do over commit because we wanna make sure that we're not throttling the application. Uh, we want good user experience. That's more important than being really, really tight on resource utilization. And then workload separation. So this is new for autopilot. Um, a guy by the name of William Dennis talked about this last KubeCon where you can specify, um, basically create ephemeral node groups based on a label you put on your workload. So that, for say for instance, you have a workload that is your, your backend workload, right? Uh, or a workload that is your front load workload. And you wanna make sure they're separated so that you don't have noisy neighbor problems. So this is a new, a new feature, but also um, the idea, if you've not read about, um, Okanis, I'm blanking, uh, pod anti-affinity. There are ways using labels to say, based on the name of my pods, make sure, or try to separate the, the uh, the workload across multiple nodes. So you have true high availability. Having 50 pods on one node is not high availability. It's not the same thing, right? So we wanna make sure we have 50 pods on 10 nodes so we have five deep across, um, across our cluster. So this is all great, right? So we started this journey three years ago. This is where we wanna go. So we literally, we have, we're one API away from being completely in Kubernetes. Um, and our next steps are to look at G GCP managed or Google, uh, yeah, GCP managed Prometheus, primarily because we want longer term metrics. Uh, right now we're limited to about 30 days on disk. Uh, Ingress API to gateway API, where if you're in this world, you're probably thinking about this to some degree because it seems like gateway API is the next step forward. 
uh, policy management in Kyverna, right? Emission controllers, the ability to put guardrails up. So the more we can give um, permissions to our engineers to put stuff into Kubernetes, we want to make sure they're making really smart decisions and not running as root, for example. Uh, and also mutating webhooks. Um, we like to label our things for information, so we can force, with mutating webhooks, we've found ways we can force some labels on system workloads so that we are able to follow billing costs and security costs and stuff like, or security management and stuff like that. And obviously, supply chain hardening and improved observability. It's obvious from the, our observability slide, that's something we're currently actively looking at, is how do we look at this stuff in, in, in a much, much um, better way? And then, my big one right now is, is GitOps in a pool mentality. So we, we come, we've been around for a long time. Push mentality has been around for a long time, right? And so this GitOps pulling the changes into your cluster, into your, into your environment, is new and is something we're, we're investigating. We're uh, looking at Argo and other tools as well for that. Okay. So that's how CNET really kind of runs our, uh, our environment. What's, what's really interesting and to think about is not necessarily that's how we run it today. Um, so CNET's been around for 20-something years, right? Been as, almost as old as I am, which is kind of funny and, and, and fun to work on to a degree. But um, before we adopted containerization, we could deploy once, maybe twice per week. Uh, the process was slow and tedious. We had to have release engineers. We had to do a lot of coordination. We had to think about heavily, how do we take this change, this one line change, and march that through our, our production, to our production environment, right? Today, we, um, man, I, I don't have a really good metric because it, it varies so much, but we deploy um, anywhere between 10 to 20 times a day to production. Uh, and then much more than that in, in non-production, right? So we can make a change in hours and get it to the front door of CNET. That's honestly the big value proposition for all of this tooling. We could, yeah, we could consume a managed service and probably run some of our services on that, but the flexibility and the speed our engineers have to meet the business requirements that are like kind of laid out for us is why we're here, right? Um, so that, that's why I like it and also, um, yeah, and, and also I've, I've been a huge Kubernetes fan for years and I was brought in to do this, so it was fun. Anyway, that's how we do it. If anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer as much as I can. Sorry for the vast amount of YAML and speed we went through that. Yeah. All right, let's get a mic, okay. Yeah. yeah, let me grab a mic so everybody can hear you. It's a big room. Just uh, curious how you would, uh, how you guys do the test automation and uh, sanity checks when um, that's you're all... pushing 10 to 20 times a day. Okay, so um, all that's actually handled by our CI/CD, um, our CI/CD system primarily. This is really focused on just getting the deployment change, right? So this was the CD less CI, like the integration validation pieces of it um, to, to be open. Um, I'm not really on that team I'm trying to think of the name of the tool. Uh, there's a Node framework that, they, that they're using for the Node applications. And then we use PHP and Symfony quite a bit. And they have some frameworks around that too. Um, I know those tests pass and fail pretty regularly because I've, I've seen them. But it's not part of my, my purview, right? Yeah. Another question? Yep. Uh, you said you're exploring on your CD strategy, right, with Argo CD and some other tools. Can you, like, Put some light on your process, like how we are going about. On how we're looking forward to the move. Okay, so at the moment, we're looking towards, uh, to, to be honest, you, so we're, we use Jenkins today, right? And so it's, it's been around for a while. It's going to be a slow migration out of that for us, most likely. Um, we've played a lot with Cloud Build uh, and Cloud Deploy, and then Argo CD. Those are kind of the three things we're, we're kind of exploring. We'll probably move our, C, our, our, our integration pieces to Cloud Build because it's native to what we're doing, and it ties into GitHub. But then the deployment part process is still up in the air. And that's really going to be us just kind of like using both for a while and going, we like this one better, or we like that one better. Tecton? Uh, no, but actually, I'm really interested in Flux after watching a couple of demos this week, just to be completely open. I, I think it's a cool tool. Yeah. Do you guys have like a, a single production cluster or multiple production clusters? Um, so when I said, and friends, right, um, there's more than just CNET that I manage, right? 
So we you, have 30 clusters in prod and 30 clusters clusters in non-prod today. So you just brands. do you have like then a, a single Promethe a Prometheus server per cluster that you have to switch between today? Yes. Okay. So our our Grafana is a gross. We we flip, flip between the the different uh, uh, the different Prometheus. Yep. And there's somewhere here. Uh, you mentioned you're using Alert Manager. Yes. Um, do you use it for all of your alerting, or Actually, do you yeah. have several systems? Well, okay, I take that back. In the past, it was our only alert man or our only alerting tool for the operations team. Um, we have moved. We're, we're we're investigating the alerts that are built into Google uh, Google's um, infrastructure, as well as the alerting as um, part of Grafana to a degree. Yep. And would you? Um, Consider, uh, you, so you, you, uh, you mentioned uh, GKE managed Prometheus. Mm -hmm. uh, they also are compatible with like exporting and importing all kind of Prometheus metrics to other um, Prometheus instances. Sure. Uh, would you consider using Alert Manager at scale for everything, or would you rather move the other way around that you're taking stuff out of Alert Manager and moving it onto a managed system? Um, so. My, my team is, we're, we're a small team, right? So there's, um, I think there's six of us now. Um, and so we will consume a managed service quicker than we will an open source service uh, if it meets our needs. Um, so it, it depends. Um, I, I don't, there, like, so black box exporter not being available right now with, with managed Prometheus is gonna hurt. Also autopilot doesn't support managed Prometheus at the moment. So it's gonna be a minute before we make that, sh that shift. Uh, but it is something we're exploring, if that makes sense. He's got a mic right behind you. Uh, you mentioned about uh, sandbox testing, mm -hmm. and the sandbox testing, obviously, you don't want to uh, expose to the public. How do you control access uh, for the product manager who you want to see those changes? Um, so we're a legacy company, right? So we have a VPN. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's truly internal, right? Um, but um, IAP, if you haven't read about uh, Google's service, uh, allows you to expose stuff externally, but validate a Google account before you get into it is one way that we are exploring uh, moving away from that. But also um, uh, use of headers. So we can, we can do some header magic, but um, uh, we, we can flip that internal external flag with a true false, right? So if we need something to be truly external and validate through the, through the CDN, we can have a test CDN service and actually validate the entire stack. Okay. So it, it depends, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, thanks for your talk. Yep. I was just curious about how you're addressing security needs or where that falls in your priorities. In, in what way? That was weird. <laughs> it was right behind my ear. <laughs> just, I mean, securing the application um, overall. Um, so uh, for like container scanning and paying attention to GCP, we have a separate security team, but we use a, cool a tool called Wiz. Um, is 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 the, the tool that our organization has chosen to use, um, but also we use um, Cloud Armor WAF. Um, we we were uh, um, oh goodness I can't think of the name of the we had another tool recently that we just migrated off. But um, again we'll man we'll take a managed service especially if it aligns with our cl cloud provider. Okay, I'm happy to talk after, but um, thank you guys so much. This has been a lot of fun. This is my first KubeCon talk. If you couldn't tell, that was really nervous. Yeah. Okay.